Hi, and welcome to this webinar focusing on investing and what are the myths of smart money. Today, we're going to hear one of the most popular business professors in the United States, a corporate finance professor from the Stern School of Business at NYU, Nasta Damodara, who was, by the way, one of the top-rated speakers of Nordic Business Forum 2018. During the webinar, Professor Damodaran will give us some advice what are the characteristics of a good investor. The slides have been sent to you by email earlier today, but you can also download next to your screen if you haven't done that before. My name is Aslak De Silva. I'm the CEO of Nordic Business Forum and the board member of Oslo Business Forum. I'll be moderating the Q&A part in the end of the presentation after Professor Damodaran has spoken. During the webinar, you will be able to ask questions through Slido. You can do that directly next to the window if you exit the full screen mode. Please do upload the questions so that others can see what is suitable for you as well and understand what you want to hear about. So at the end of the webinar, we will take in the questions that you are most likely the ones that you've been uploading the most and are the most popular in the feed. And without the Dean of Valuation, Professor Aswat Damodara. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I am so glad to be here. In fact, I'm getting really used to doing these sessions from my home and I might never travel again. This is so much easier. Uh, I, before I start on, my, on, on, on the topic, uh, there are three things that happen in every crisis. The first is we all lose perspective. We get so focused on the crisis that we can't lift our eyes up and look at what's happening beyond the crisis. The second is you lose faith. You lose faith in everything you know, everything you've been taught, the frameworks that made you successful, you give up on them. And the third thing that happened is you look to the experts. You want somebody to tell you what to do. It's human nature. So you watch CNBC, you read the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, you read what experts are telling you you should do. So what I'd like to talk about today is that third dimension. This, the notion of smart money. Let me explain what I mean by smart money and stupid money. So let's, let's start with, with what the difference is between smart and stupid money. At least in terms of the mythology, here's what smart money supposedly does. Smart money basically senses when the market is going to go up, when it's going to go down, and essentially figures out when to get out before everybody else and get in before everybody else. Smart money also knows which stocks to invest in. What does stupid money do? It's driven by mood and momentum. It acts on emotion, it panics. So smart money supposedly makes all the money and stupid money loses the money. At least in this mythology, you know who the smart money is, right? It's professional money managers, experts on TV that you see, people who write about investing all the time. What's stupid money? It's supposedly the rest of us, retail investors, are supposedly, supposedly stupid money. Professionals are the smart money. Now I'd like to dig a little deeper into why this myth got created in the first place. What is the basis for this myth of smart money? The first is anecdotal evidence. Uh, stories you read about people who made a lot of money. For instance, when you think about smart money, you think about people like Warren Buffett or George Soros. And if you think about why they got anointed as smart money, it's because of something they did in the past that made them a lot of money. For instance, if you look at the, uh, the evidence that backs up what Warren Buffett uh, you know, says is it, uh, the myth of Warren Buffett, it goes back to the 1960s and things he did. And let's face it, he did some really smart things that made him a lot of money. So the first basis for the myth is anecdotal evidence, stories from the past of how people have made money during a crisis or when a company was down. The second, and let's face this, there's a lot of self-promotion in the money management business. No hedge fund manager can be described as a shy person. So when hedge fund managers succeed, guess what they do? They go on top of the rooftop and they yell out about how much money they make. They're masters at self-promotion, and that self-promotion leads people to believe that they must win all the time. And third, I blame academia. I come from, uh, my history is in academic finance, even though I'm not an academic anymore. In academic finance, we've written papers about how you can beat the market. For about 50 years, we've been writing papers, you can do this, you can do this, and beat the market. 
In fact, if you believe academic journals, it must be really easy to beat the market, at least on paper. So if you look at the basis of myth, it's this collection of three things. Stories you hear about great investors. George Soros's reputation comes from that 1990s, you know, when in the 1990s he beat the Bank of England and made hundreds of millions of dollars. I'm not denying he did that, but that is the basis for the mythology. Now, if you look at the problem with each of these pieces of evidence to back up the mythology, each piece comes with its own problems. Let's start with the anecdotal evidence. When you ask people, how do you know people beat the market? They give you names and say, what about Warren Buffett? What about George Soros? What about Jim Simon? And the fact that some investors have beaten the market for a long time, they say is evidence that markets are not efficient. But is it? Let's play a purely statistical game. Let's assume you start with millions of people in the market, which is not an assumption, it's the truth. And you let them play the game over and over and over again. Statistically, won't a few of them end up beating the market period after period after period? I mean, it's in fact very difficult in investing to separate where luck stops and skill begins. One of my favorite um, authors, Mike Mabusum, a good friend of mine who writes really deep stuff that brings together finance and psychology and statistics has written an entire book on how difficult it is to separate luck from skill. In investing, it is very difficult to figure out how much of an investor's success comes from luck and how much from skill. But that doesn't stop us from using anecdotal evidence. The second is there's very selective storytelling. The stories you hear are always about the wins. So in the case of Warren Buffett, one of the stories that gets told and retold over and over again was how much money he made on American Express in the 1960s. For those of you who don't know the story, here's what happened. American Express, the credit card company, owned a, a piece of a salad oil company. And for whatever reason, the salad oil company had a scandal, something poisoned in the salad. And as a consequence, American Express stock price dropped. Legend has it that Warren Buffett looked at the cash flow franchise behind the credit card and said, the stock looks cheap, I'm going to buy it. And he made hundreds of millions of dollars. And that story gets told over and over again. You're saying, what's wrong with that? You notice that there are no stories told about the losses that Warren Buffett has suffered over time. Why doesn't anybody talk about the fact that he bought Kraft Heinz and he's crashed and burned on Kraft Heinz? I'm not picking on Warren Buffett. My point with anecdotal evidence is when you see successful stories, they get embellished over time and they get viewed as evidence that that investor is a great investor. Third, the problem with anecdotal evidence is also a function of time and place. What do I mean by that? Let's accept as a fact that Warren Buffett's been a great investor. But much of his success happened in the 20th century, right? Between the late, in the early 60s to 2000. He's been a very average investor for the last 20 years. What if, and this might be sacrilege, what if his success was a function of the market and time he was in? In other words, what he used to find successes worked in the U.S. equity market in the second part of the 20th century. And what if those times have passed? What if markets have changed, the economy has changed? In fact, I do a session on value investing where I argue that what's wrong with old time value investing, you know what I mean by old time value investing, doing what um, you know Ben Graham suggested in security analysis is not working for a very simple reason. The world has changed under you. So when you see people use anecdotal evidence, keep this in mind. The stories that people tell you about successes are selective and they don't suggest and they, they're not proof that people actually beat the market. Now, if you look at investor track records, you're saying, but those are facts, right? So when a hedge fund manager shows me how much money he's made, no, I should believe that, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. And here's why. You know, a lot of hedge fund managers, when they present their records, are not presenting real records, but records on paper. You're saying, what do, what do you mean? Well, they take an investment strategy that they, they tell you they're going to use, and then they look back in time and say, if I'd adopted this strategy, it's a pure hypothetical, how much money would I've made over the last 10 years? So when you see a portfolio manager show you a record, the first question to ask is, is this a real record, money you've actually made, or is this a hypothetical? The second is, many of these studies or many of these records that show you how much money hedge fund managers make or professional money managers make are before transactions cost and before taxes. 
These are incredible drains on returns. It's amazing how quickly returns and strategies start to dissipate once you bring in transactions costs. I'll give you a very simple example. There are studies that show that investing in illiquid stocks, stocks with, where there's very little trading, deliver higher returns than stocks that are liquid. That sounds good, right? Saying, why shouldn't I invest in illiquid stocks? Well, many of these studies quote returns before you take into account the transactions cost of investing in liquid stocks. I'll give you another example. There are studies that show that if you buy loser stocks, stocks that have gone down the most over the last three or five years, you will make money over the next five. That sounds good, right? But it turns out that almost half of these loser stocks trade at very low stock prices. You're saying, so what? Well, the transactions cost on low price stocks is incredibly high. By the time you factor those costs in, you might not make money. And finally, when you look at track records, you got to factor in, and this is something I talked about earlier, how much of it is due to luck and separating luck from skill is very difficult to do. So just because somebody shows you a track record doesn't make them a smart investor. Finally, let, let me pick on academics. I, for one, I'm very skeptical about academic research that claims to show that a particular investment strategy works. There's many a slip between the cup and the lip. So what you see as returns on paper very quickly start to dissipate when you bring them under the sunlight. I'll give you a simple and very, very real example. I don't know whether you've heard of Value Line. Value Line is a very old investment advisory service in the US that you can subscribe to. And one of the big selling points of Value Line is they classify stocks into five classes based on how good they, 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 say, they think they are as investments. These classes are called timeliness classes from one through five. So if you look at a value line ad, they'll show you how much money you'd have made investing in stocks with the timeliness one stocks. So about 20 years ago, value line bought into its own hype. It actually started a mutual fund to invest in the stocks. It was telling people were those great stocks. You know what that mutual fund did? Terribly. It actually was not able to deliver the returns you saw on paper because it found that when it went out to try to buy the stocks, it didn't get them at the prices that you were able to get them hypothetically. It had to factor in transactions costs. And after those costs were factored in, its returns dissipated. Here's the second problem with academic research. Our access to data has become incredibly good. So today you can get data on intraday. I mean, basically you can slice and dice the data. There's a lot of data mining going on out there. You know what I mean by data mining? You have hundreds of academic researchers around the world, perhaps thousands, looking at the data, looking for something that beats the market. And guess what? If you look through thousands of strategies, again, purely based upon statistics, some of those strategies are going to work, look like they work, look like they work purely on luck. And finally, if you believe academics are objective, let go of that delusion. We all have agendas. If you think an academic sits down to look at a strategy with a blank slate, without priors, you're wrong. Most academics have agendas. And when you see research, you have to ask, is this research advancing an agenda? And if you see somebody claiming that something works and this is their pet topic, don't be surprised. So as you look at this notion of smart and stupid money, there's a very simple way in which smart versus this mythology plays out. Now, if you believe that there is smart money, here's what you're going to do. You're going to give your money to a professional money manager to, man to manage, right? Whether it's a mutual fund manager, a hedge fund manager, or a wealth, or a wealth manager. You're going to pay that person one or two percent of your wealth. And if you're crazy, maybe pay 20 percent of the upside. Remember, hedge funds, it's two and 20 or even three and 30. Why do you do this? Because you believe that professional money managers can make more returns for you even after those costs. And therefore, you trust it. That's called active money management. In active money management, you let you either you or you, you pick somebody to allocate your money across different asset classes and pick stocks within those classes. Now, let's say you don't believe that there is such a thing as smart money. Well, you could invest your money passively, right? You could invest your money in index funds. And it's not like it is in the 1970s or 80s where the only index fund you had was in the S&P 500. Today, you can have index funds that capture pretty much any asset class in the world. In fact, it's gotten a lot easier in the last decade with ETFs. ETFs allow you to invest in an asset class or a group of stocks 
without paying somebody significant portions of your money. So we've had this fight between passive and active investing play out over the last 50 years, starting with the Jack Bogle invention of the index fund, but it's intensified over the last decade. And if you think about active investing, remember it covers a whole set of different strategies. You can have macro active investors. These are the investors who, who think their skill is in market timing. They tell you which asset classes to invest. You can have stock selectors and those stock selectors can range anywhere from you know, traditional old time value investors who buy stocks that are low P, high dividend stocks or growth investors. It could even be momentum investors. And finally, you can have arbitrage based strategies where you believe that you found a market mistake. So when you think about active investing, it covers a whole string of different philosophies. But as I said, this fight has been going on for a long time. Early in the game, you go back to the 1960s, the assumption people made, and this is a reasonable assumption, was that professional money managers who are smarter than the rest of us, have more data than the rest of us, hire the best in analysts, have more tools, should be able to meet the market was taken on faith until 1968. You see what happened in 1968. In 1968, a professor at the University of Chicago, an assistant professor called Michael Jensen said, hey, is that true? Do professional money managers beat the market? And he did the very first study of mutual funds. In 1968, there weren't that many mutual funds in the US. There were about 125 actively listed mutual funds. He took the 125 mutual funds and he did a very simple analysis. He looked at the returns on those mutual funds versus what you'd have made investing in the market. And he compared. He expected, I, th I think, initially to find that the mutual funds delivered returns higher than the market. Here's what he found. On average, these mutual funds in 1968 delivered about one and a half percent less than the market. He published the paper. He was surprised. But in the process, he created one of the most enduring findings in research. Active money managers underperform the market. And active money managers have pushed back against that finding ever since. Initially, they claim well, it was because of the risk and return model that they use. It's amazing how many people have found a way to blame the CAPM and betas for every one of their sins. It, hey, that's what caused it. Well, it turns out that the findings are almost immune to different kinds of risk and return models. And starting about 20 years ago, this research on whether mutual funds beat the market has become much more mainstream. Standard & Poor's, for instance, does a very simple comparison. No risk and return models. Here's what they do. They look at the percentage of mutual funds that beat the market beat the index. And in fact, they have indices for different kinds of mutual funds, because after all, if you are a mutual fund in the S&P 500, I should compare you to the S&P 500. If you're a mutual fund focused on growth stocks, I should compare it to a growth index. They compare what percentage of funds beat the index. And the numbers are stupendously bad for active mutual funds. In fact, if you look at this, this, this table, you look at large cap, mid cap and small cap funds. And across the board, look at the results. 85 to 90 percent, in fact, more than 90 percent of large cap funds you know, are, are, are beaten by an index. Now, are you surprised that passive index indexing is beating active investing? Clearly, at least in, uh, in the aggregate, active money managers underperform the index. You see, maybe it's different if I invest in value funds. Well, not really. Look at each of these five charts based upon whether you invest in value or growth or, or, or different kinds of philosophies across the board. Indices beat the funds. Okay? Maybe you're saying it's different in emerging markets. Not really. In every single categorization by geography, you see that indices beat active money managers. See, maybe it's different with bonds or with futures. Again, the results are, are horrifically bad. No matter how you slice the data, it looks like on average active money managers are beaten by indices. Now, when you confront money managers with this evidence, which is almost you can't contest the evidence. It is so clearly against active money management. You know what the justification is? It's those guys out there. These are average money managers, but the best money managers beat the market. 
Huh? Let's see if that's true. If it is, it is true that the average is being dragged down by bad money managers, well, then the winners should continue to be winners over time. And here's the evidence against that. There is no consistency in this game. It's not like the losers drag down the average and the winners keep winning. There is very little evidence that winners stay winners. The easiest way to see this is by looking at a correlation matrix between rankings in one year versus rankings in the next. So for those of you who have forgotten your statistics, here's what you should expect to see. If you have consistency, if you're in the top quartile in one year, you should be in the top quartile in the next year. And if you look across the board, there is almost no consistency. In fact, if this were a purely random game, each of those numbers should be 25%. What does that mean? There's an equal chance, no matter what quartile you're in, in one year, that you'll be in a different quartile the next year. There is no consistency in this game. So not only do money managers on average underperform the market, there is no evidence the winners stay winners for long. You say, what if I have a superstar manager? Well, here's some evidence against that either. Superstar managers get their reputations because they beat the market for two years, three years, five years. But if you track them over time, every one of them almost to the person comes back to it, which tells you that a lot of superstardom is driven by luck, not by skill. So what does this all mean? In the contest between active and passive money management, passive money managers have been winning the game. It's, and this has accelerated over the last decade. As I said, this game started in the 1970s, but for a long time, active money managers held their own. The market share of money managed by active money managers still stayed high until you get to the last decade. So if you look at this graph, here's what I'm graphing out. I'm graphing out fund flows from and to active and passive money managers. Take a look at the green columns. Those are fund flows into ETFs and index funds. So as you can see, money flowing into passive vehicles. And if you look at the red columns, these are money, this is money flowing out of active money management. This is no longer a question of if it's happening. It clearly is happening. Money is flowing out of active money management into passive money management. So you can look at the market shares. And over the last decade, the share of money managed by passive vehicles, ETFs and index funds, has increased relative to active vehicles. Now you say, what happened in the last decade? Well, the first is, I think there's more transparency now. Let me explain. 30 years ago, if you invested with a mutual fund, you got a statement in the mail every year telling you how your fund was doing. You were up 12%. You had no frame of reference. I mean, you had a job to do. You weren't tracking the market. You weren't comparing the 12% to something else. Today, you can track what your fund is doing on your phone. And simultaneously, you can track what everybody else is doing. So the first thing that's happening is that people are more aware of the fact that active money managers do a terrible job. Let me be quite honest. Active money management has never been good. It's not like it turned bad in the last decade. It's now more visible than it used to be. That's the first thing that happened. The second thing that happened is passive investing has gotten a lot easier and a lot broader. As I said, for much of the early part of this fight, if you wanted to invest in an index fund, you had to invest in the S&P 500 index fund. The choices have multiplied. If you go to the Vanguard website or the BlackRock website, you will see the choices are in the dozens. You can find index funds for emerging markets, developed markets, small cap, large cap, high growth, low growth. You pick the grouping of stocks as an index fund out there. And you also have ETFs. What do ETFs allow you to do? They allow you to replicate an investment strategy in, in almost no time. Let me explain. Let's assume you have an active money manager who's found a way to make money. I mean, it could be any kind of strategy. If the strategy is mechanical, you know what I mean by mechanical? You run four screens to find your best stocks, low P, high growth. And you found this magical four screen approach that gives you great stocks and you start to make money as an active money manager. That's good, right? But remember, your strategy is mechanical. Here's what I can do. I can create an ETF that replicates your strategy. And in 15 minutes, your excess returns go away. So here's what's happened in the last decade. 
mechanical active investing, which unfortunately is 90% of active investing, has become easy to replicate. And if you look at what's happened over the last decade, this has been long overdue, but in a sense, what's happened over the last decade has accelerated that shift. Now, over this last decade, active investors have wagged their fingers at people who invest in ETFs and index funds. Here's what they've said. Well, this is a very unique market. And of course, you can always blame the Fed, right? It's all quantitative easing, low interest rates that are allowing you to make money. And they said, just wait. Wait for what? Wait for a crisis. And then you're going to see how wrong you were investing in these passive vehicles. Their argument was in a crisis, you would see why active investing needed to play a role. Well, they've had their chance now. We've been in a full-blown full crisis for the last few months, and the evidence is still preliminary, it could still change, but let's see how active money management is done during this crisis. Early on, remember, much of this crisis, at least in, in developed markets, played out between February 14th and March 20th. So I was waiting for the first quarter results to come in with active mutual funds, and the results are now in. Morningstar tracks how active mutual funds have done during the first quarter of 2020. Remember, this was a crisis period, and if active money man mutual funds were doing their job, they should have done better than the rest of us. Well, in seven of the nine classes that, Mor that Morningstar follows, active mutual funds underperform their specific indices. And across all active mutual funds, here's what they found. Active mutual funds have delivered about 1.3% less than you'd have made investing in the index during this crisis. So if you look at the percentage of mutual funds outperformed by the market, it's still greater than 50%, even in the midst of one of the worst crises that we've had for the last few decades, active money managers are being beaten by indices. You say, but that's just mutual funds. What about hedge funds? They must be better, right? Well, let's look at hedge funds. Hedge funds are having just as many problems as active mutual funds. They're actually underperforming as well. In fact, I, uh, for some of you might have read the stories about Robin Hood app investors. I'm not going to defend many of these investors. They're investing based on a whim. They're treating it as gambling. But guess what? Over the last three months, stocks picked by Robin Hood app investors, these are amateurs, are beating hedge fund picks by almost 16%. So you're saying, what's wrong with active investing? These guys are smart. They went to the right schools. They have some, they have more data than the rest of us. They, have, they hire the best analysts. What's going on? Here, I think, are the roots of the active investing malaise. We now live in a flatter investment world than we did 40 years ago. Let me explain. In the 1980s, getting data was expensive. Having a mainframe computer was expensive. If you worked at a big, you know, if you worked at Fidelity or you worked at Goldman Sachs, you had an advantage over a small investor. That advantage is now dissipated in much of the Western world. The second is I find many active investing, you know, especially portfolio managers, have no core philosophy. What does that mean? They have no real reason for investing in markets. What they do is they chase success, whatever worked last year. Third is many active investing investors, portfolio managers, have bloated cost structures. I go into these buildings that are 25 floors high with thousands of people working on them. So what do all these people do? And finally, a lot of active investing has become incredibly lazy. I look at what they do and say, hey, I could do this at almost no cost. But don't take, it's not just the professional money managers. I think clients bear some of the blame as well. Many clients don't want to know. They don't, they don't want to dig deep. They're long-term in principle. They tell you they're long-term and they're short-term. They want active money managers to make them a lot of money quickly, but they say, don't ever lose money from me. And they don't want to take responsibility. This is a collective problem. Active money managers and clients, in a sense, deserve each other because they both bring weaknesses to this game. So do I think there's a future for active investing? Yes, but I think it will be smaller. Disruption is coming if it hasn't come already. And I think that quant, you know, those people who think that artificial intelligence and data mining is going to give you, no, it's not. In fact, if your answer is mechanical, I guarantee you, you're going to be imitated and your returns are going to go away. So you're saying, if I want to be an active investor, what should I do? I give you a roadmap. First, find an investment philosophy that fits you, not 
Warren Buffett, not Peter Lynch, not George Soros, find an investment philosophy that's right for you. Second, have faith in your philosophy, but keep the feedback loop open. In other words, say those three most freeing words in investing. I was wrong and be willing to change. And find the edge that will make you successful. You need to bring something to the table to be able to take something away. Think of what you have that is unique or different that will allow you to make money. So I'm going to suggest as a final point that rather than think of money as smart money versus stupid money, that you think of money as humble money versus arrogant money. What's the difference? Humble investors, when they're successful, know that a big chunk of their success comes from being lucky, being at the right time, at the right place, uh, the right place at the right time. And when they're wrong, recognize that they need to change. Arrogant investors think that every investing win is a sign of their skill and every failure is somebody else's fault. So if I had to pick somebody to manage my money, I want it to be humble money, not arrogant money. What are the signs of arrogance? Anybody who makes a 300-year plan. Master San, are you listening? Is not a humble person. I would not trust SoftBank to manage my money simply because it's driven by arrogance, the notion that they're smarter than everybody else. Except humility, I think, is the, is the single most important characteristic you need to be a successful investor. So I'm going to pause, stop, given that I, you know, I'd like to get your question, your q and in. I'm going to pause right there and kind of give you a chance to ask me questions. But I hope you found this session to be something of use. And if you're an active money manager and you want to challenge me, I'd welcome the challenge. And I'm, I'm willing to debate with anybody where the future of success in active money management is going to be. But I think this notion of smart money has to be let go. So don't look to CNBC for answers to where you should be investing. Look inward. Ownership of your investment decisions. And if you do, I think you have a chance of success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Demer. That was interesting. And uh, let's see if we get challenged. And uh, we'll go back to the Q&A soon and, and give you a short break here. But before moving on to the q and I, I want to briefly just talk about uh, our online learning platforms, uh, live.mbforum.com and obforum.com, where you actually can gain access to previous speeches from our events. So you will have uh, recordings from Jim Collins, to Good to Great, and also um, How the Mighty Fall. You can get see interviews from uh, Brené Brown, Sarah Blakely on, on our live stream studio, but also gain access to the recordings of webinars like this. And, and we have had plenty of those during uh, during this time. So we have the Professor Gary Hamill. We have even uh, Risto Silasma talking about uh, scenarios and how to build scenarios in the future. Rita McGrath and, and Robbie Kelman-Baxter about uh, uh, how you actually gain um, momentum with uh, forever promise to your customers, so subscription models and so on. So all, all those you can access and, and gain your access by buying a license. There are individual licenses for your use and business passes for a bigger corporate packages if you are interested in that. But now let's go back to the Q&A. So super interesting questions that we have and, and please ask more of those and, and upload those the ones that you want to hear more about. But let, let's go first. Um, here's an audience question. So I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly. But Johannes is saying here that, uh, first of all, thank you, Professor. Your classes are my <laughs> favorite. Can't thank you enough. And uh, do you think we are having a depression due to COVID? And, and what do you think about the Fed's reaction? Well, I think that the market clearly doesn't believe that, that, I mean, clearly right now the economic news is abysmal, right? I mean, you look at every single macroeconomic indicator the numbers we haven't seen. In fact, even during the Great Depression, unemployment claims, you know, you see the, you know, consumer confidence, but that shouldn't be surprising, right? When in history have we ever shut the global economy down like we have for COVID? I mean, it's never happened before. And uh, the analogy I would offer is, let's say you park your car, turn off the engine in your driveway, and then you go check the speedometer. And then you're shocked that the speedometer is zero. Why would you be surprised? So I think one of the things to be careful about is not to overreact to the macroeconomic indicators you're getting right now. It's our job to forecast the future. I remember one of the things I said happens during a crisis, you lose perspective. You have to think forward. You have to think what will happen after the crisis ends. In other words, you've got to get your eyes off the crisis, look beyond. 
What does the market seem to think? The market seems to think that we will come back, not quickly, at least reasonably quickly from the crisis, and we will not be damaged long term. Could the market be wrong? Absolutely. As I said, we've never run this experiment in history. So we don't know whether the engine will start back up when we start the engine. We don't know how quickly people will get back into doing what they used to do, buy stuff as they used to. Maybe there will be permanent changes that will damage the economy. Right now is, and this is where humility comes in. If you're a macroeconomic expert and somebody asks you, what do you think will happen over the next year? The honest answer you should be giving is, I don't know. And it'll be arrogant of me to say, I am right, the market is wrong. But that's what I hear from a lot of experts is, hey, I'm right, I know what's gonna happen over the next year. How do you know? No, this has never happened before. You can't look at history and replay history. So I think right now economies are suffering, but they're suffering because we've shut them down deliberately. The real question is what will happen when we start back up again? And we're going to start to get evidence on that sooner rather than later. As for the Fed, I think we overestimate the role of the Fed. I think the Fed has done a really good job during this crisis. Because what turned this crisis around, at least in the U.S., in the last period, last week of March, was the Fed's announcement that we are backstop in the corporate bond and lending markets. Not the quantitative easing, it's that decision. Because what did it do? It released the private markets. The Fed doesn't have enough money to sustain an economy. It needs to trigger private investors to do things differently. So has the Fed had a role? Absolutely, it's had a role, but it's a role it should always have, which is to get private markets off the ground and get them going. And that's what's allowed the markets to turn around. Whether it will allow the economy to turn around is a different question. That's interesting. But do, do you see now something happening here? Because obviously, like you said, that we need to look forward, not just like what happened. But during the crisis, if you look at stock prices of Zoom or, or Netflix, so they were going skyrocketing where others were plummeting and now others are gaining the momentum back or something. Has something really changed now in the valuation or how you perceive things in the in the stock markets now because of the crisis and new new data coming and everything? Yeah. I think in a sense, the fact that the market is almost back to where it was before the crisis doesn't mean every stock is back up. There's been a redistribution of value that's happened during this crisis. Let me be more specific. Amazon has increased in market cap $400 billion during this crisis. Forget about the zooms of the world. If you look at the FANG stocks, they've increased in value collectively by almost a trillion dollars. Why? Because I think they're going to come out of this crisis stronger than they were going into the crisis. If you are worried about the FANG stocks taking over the world before the crisis, you should be even more worried after the crisis because they have a lot of cash and many smaller companies will need them to survive and succeed. So I think what you're going to see after this crisis is a strengthening of some of the trends you saw coming into this crisis. Tech companies gaining at the expense of manufacturing companies. Those trend, trends have been accelerated during the crisis. In fact, uh, a week ago, I wrote a post on, um, cor on corporate life cycles. In fact, the topic I talked about in my la last uh, talk to the Nordic Bus Business Forum. And I showed with data that young companies have actually been hurt less than older companies. High growth companies have been hurt less than low growth companies. There's a redistribution going on because the market at least sees changes coming out of this crisis. Companies that are less capital intensive with less debt gaining at the expense of companies that are more capital intensive. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. You want a challenge, challenging from the question. So here's Antti Burkholm challenging your view and asking like your present, presentation seems to suggest that there are no talented investors at all. Do you really think that this is the case? And he's still saying, I do support vast majority of the points you made, but you still do believe that? I think there are too many talented investors. If you define talent as I've got the right training, I've got the right analysts, we have too many of them. In fact, one of my favorite books is, um, is by Peter Ellis and basically he called it, um, I'm, uh, it uh, Charlie Ellis, I'm sorry. He called investing the loser's game. And he called it the loser's game because he, he gave the analogy of being in a tennis club and being a professional player 
and everybody else is an amateur. They don't know you're a professional. So what do you do? You play each of them and you bet money. And the professional money man, a professional tennis player wins almost all of the time. He makes a lot of money. And then another professional player learns that he's making money. So he joins the club. Again, nobody knows he's, but soon, sooner or later, here's what happens. 35 of the 60 members of the club are professional players and they play each other most of the time. My problem with active money managers is you're not beating mom and pop investors. You're playing against other investors who have exactly the same resources. They hire people from MIT and Stanford, just like you do. They have big computers, just like you do. They have access to S&P capital like you and fax it just like you do. Where's your edge? That's why I said, don't tell me you're talented. Don't tell me where your analyst went to school. Tell me what you can do differently because without that edge, you can't beat the market. The market collectively will beat you simply because you're competing against other people of exactly what you have. Hmm, thank you for that. Another question from the audience here is asking a Professor Damodaran, as we all are lifelong learners, how has your deep and extensive valuation expertise formed your own invest investment views? Could I ask who you most admire as an investor in this context, mostly in public markets? I, I'll be quite honest. I, I don't play. I, I, think, I think of what happens in investing is idol worship. I've for, lo for a long time argued that those people who make that trip out to Omaha every year of what I call investing would stop. Where they go to the Berkshire Hathaway meetings and they listen to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger tell you what to do. I'm missing the boat. I tell people that the person you need to most understand to be a good investor is yourself. I tell people to read less, think more. Understand where you're coming from, what makes you uncomfortable, what makes you comfortable. So are there people I, I admire? There are dimensions of people I admire. I admire Warren Buffett's core philosophy, that he's been faithful to that philosophy. I admire, you know, if you look at George Soros, I admire his macro focus. There are things that people do that I admire. I, I admire Mike Mabusin's uh, bringing together different disciplines. I admire people, you know, parts of what people do, but there are other parts that I feel open about disagreeing with. I can admire Warren Buffett and also say he was wrong when he sold airline stocks based on what I thought was very empty reasoning. So I think you can admire people and disagree with them. Don't put them on a pedestal. Thank you so much. Yeah. Before going to the last last question, so so I of course want to thank all the attendees there um, for this interesting session, and uh, we are interested in knowing and understanding what you think of this and and otherwise. So we'll be sending you a survey link after this, and and really value your comments and feedbacks and and new ideas that what you will have for us in the future. So really appreciate and thanks in advance already for that. And of course, huge thanks to you, Professor Damodaran, thank for the really interesting insights and. Uh, then, then for the last question here, um, Carolina is, is asking and, and commenting that uh, many thanks for interesting overview of smart investor myth. You mentioned that the value investing changes due to changes in market. Could you please share your insights how to be in tune with the environment changes here? I think old time value investing is in trouble. What I mean by old time value investing is you're told to buy stocks that trade at low multiples of book value, you know, or even below book value. You're told to buy stocks that pay big dividends. I think that was an investment strategy that worked really well in the last century. It's no longer working. And here's why. Book value means a lot less now than it did 30 years ago. 30 years ago, when you looked at the book value of a company, you were looking at manufacturing companies. Book value actually reflected what they had invested in land and building and equipment and machinery. Today, if you look at a technology company, your book value means almost nothing. What does the book value of Microsoft even mean when the bulk of your value comes from intangible assets? So book value based investing, which is what a lot of old time value investing is, has lost its way. You think, what about dividends? More and more companies globally, not just in the US, are shifting away from dividends. Dividends are sticky. You have to pay them in good times and bad times. Companies are shifting to more flexible ways of returning cash. I know there's a huge debate about stock buybacks, but at the core of the shift to stock buybacks is the fact that buybacks are flexible. You can stop them when you're not doing well. 
dividends are sticky. So by focusing on dividends and, and book value, I think old time value investing has lost its way. So what should you do if you believe in value? You've got to become much more forward looking and dynamic. I classify myself as a value investor, but I also feel free as a value investor to buy a company like Uber, a company that would never have been on the list of old time value investors, I think was undervalued when it hit $20 per share. So I think you need to kind of throw away the old rule book and think about value in a much more holistic, much more dynamic way. And I think you can still make it work. Yeah, thank you so much. I still want to ask, I see the question coming. What's your pick of the day? What's the, what's the company that we should look for now? Well, I think that you know, my big entry into the market happened in mid-March when I bought, I mean, I, I bought some of the companies and, and I, got, I just got lucky. I, you know, I, I had no idea the market was going to turn, but I did value Boeing in the middle of March and I found it to be undervalued, but it's kind of shot through my, my upper end. I'm looking at some of the companies that are in the spotlight right now. You know, you have Fastly, you have, many of these are tech companies, Zoom. I think the market is overreached on many of them because the market is looking for companies that benefit from the crisis and companies like Zoom are so obviously benefiting from the crisis that I think they're going to get overvalued. What I'm looking for are companies that are benefiting from the crisis, but their names are not out there. So if you're looking for companies to invest in, that's what I would do. I would look below the surface at companies that are benefiting from the crisis, but people are not noticing that they're benefiting. And if you can find them, then I think you've got a potential building block at least for a successful investment strategy. Thank you so much, Professor Damodar. It's always a pleasure to listen to you and, and just get to learn from your wisdom. Really great to have you here. And thanks everyone else on the, on the line as well. And uh, um, I hope that you will take care, all the best and stay healthy, you and your family there as well. So from us, Nordic Business Forum, Master of Business Forum, bye for now and hope to see you soon again.